Daniel chapter number 6, we have the context of the kingdom or the empire of Persia. We have Darius reigning over the empire of Persia. And, and in this, at this time, it tells us there in verse number 1 that it pleased him to set over, uh, to set over the kingdom or the provinces uh, 120 men. And then over those 120 men over each province that are looking over them, there are three presidents, Daniel being one. Certain men grow envious, of course, as we read, and they end up going and, and, and conspiring against Daniel to try to find something bad about Daniel. And what he says is there's nothing bad, basically. That's what they end up coming up to. And that's a great reputation to have. And there's nothing wrong with him. If we're going to find anything wrong with him, we're going to find something wrong with him with him and his God, with the customs of his God. So they end up, of course, uh, you know, going to the king and persuading the king to pass a law that no one's allowed to ask a petition of anyone but Darius, who was the king. And then they catch Daniel, of course, praying. And I want to focus there in verse number 10. The Bible says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed. I want you to pay attention to that. Daniel knew that the writing was signed. He's not unaware of this law. He's well aware of this law. And when Daniel, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. Notice that as well, as he did a four time. Nothing changed here for Daniel. The title of my sermon is derived from verse number 10, where the Holy Spirit makes the statement, it says, now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and it says this, and his windows being opened in his chamber. The title of the sermon is Leave Your Windows Open. I'm preaching about not being ashamed this morning, not being ashamed of Christianity, not being ashamed of Jesus, the name of Jesus, not being ashamed of the Word of God. Now, Daniel here was ended up receiving serious persecution, persecution that none of us have ever received. Now, there are different levels of persecution, of course, and we may have received persecution to some degree for the name of Jesus, whatever it may be, but it's nothing near what Daniel you know, received here, what Daniel experienced. Now, in the United States of America, throughout our history, we have been known as being a Christian nation as far as the majority of the people in our nation are Christian. They worship you know, the God of the Bible in some sense. They may not all be saved, but they would identify as a Christian, correct? At this time today in the, in the United States and growing even more so in the, than the past, just continually, you know, people are being mocked for being a Christian. Right. And today in the United States, it's harder to stand up and be a Christian than ever before. It's not near as hard as it was for Daniel, but it's getting harder and harder. The Bible tells us that as time goes on in the last days, there will be more and more mockers in the last days. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter number 3, Verse number three, knowing this verse, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. It goes on in uh, verse number four of them, you know, mocking that Jesus Christ will be returning one day. They're mocking Christianity, mocking the second, you know, coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously mocking his validity, mocking his word and what he said was true. They're mocking the word of God and Christianity. Jude uh, verse number 18, there's only one chapter in Jude. Jude, verse number 18, has a very similar verse. It says this, How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Notice that these are wicked people walking after their own lust. And it says that they will come in the last days. And even more so today in the United States than ever before, People mock Christianity. People mock the idea of Jesus. Pe people mock and they laugh at and they ridicule the word of God. So as a Christian in the United States, you have to be stronger today than you were in the past. It was much easier to be a Christian, uh, you know, 200 years ago than it, than it is today. And it will get harder in the future. It's getting harder as each day goes on. So you need to make sure that you're settled in your mind and you need to make sure that you're not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to make sure that you're not ashamed of the Bible. And just like in every other area, I, you know, I have no problem of standing against the majority. Valiant Baptist Church and the people here should have no problem with standing against the majority in this same area. I don't care how many scoffers and mockers rise up against Jesus I love Jesus, and I'm going to stand for the name of Jesus. And I'm going to make sure that I settle in my heart. I don't care in 20 years if it becomes illegal to pray. I don't care in 30 years if I'm not allowed to carry a Bible. 
I'm carrying a Bible. I'm reading my Bible. There's nothing that's going to stop me, you know, to serve Jesus and to worship Jesus. I'm keeping the commandments that are in this book, and I'm keeping this physical book with me. And you will have to, I'm, and I'm not exaggerating, you will have to pry this book from my cold, dead fingers before I give this book up. Amen. I am going to serve Jesus until I die. And right. nothing's changed. And you know what's going to cause you to stand up for Jesus? Not being ashamed. The more shame that you have in your heart, the more you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the more you love Jesus, the less ashamed you're going to be. The more you read your Bible, the more you're going to love these words in the Bible, the more you're going to cherish these words. And we need to not be ashamed, you know, of, of the mockery of this generation. I want you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter number one. Verse number 16. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. Of course, the, uh, the, the basis, the central teaching of Christianity is the gospel. That is the central teaching of Christianity. The central teaching of Christianity is Jesus, right? And what is Jesus known for? He's known for the gospel. That's what the gospel is. It's the story of Jesus Christ. That is the core teaching of Christianity, the gospel. And look at what Paul says about the gospel in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. For I, <clears throat> excuse me, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. So notice the statement that Paul makes. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And we need to follow Paul's example. That one area where we could definitely purge a lot from this, uh, us being a soul winning church, is just going soul winning. What are you doing when you go soul winning? You're preaching the gospel. You need to not be ashamed. Sometimes you can have that, that, that embarrassment creep up You know, when you're giving the gospel. A lot of people come around when you're giving the gospel. You can have that feeling. You shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. There's nothing to be ashamed about the gospel. Right. Notice what he says there. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now watch this. He explains to you why he's not ashamed. For, that means because, it's very important. He's saying because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. What is there to be ashamed about the gospel? Right. It's the power of how man is saved. There's yeah. nothing to be ashamed about it. All these other religions... You know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Mormonism, whatever you want to look at, they're the ones that should be ashamed. Right. You know, you, who's, who's most commonly mocks the Bible? Who are those that commonly are scoffers today would be an atheist? You know who needs to be ashamed? Somebody who's dumb enough to believe in evolution. Right. Where's their power in that? Yeah, nothing created everything. It's the dumbest, you know, theory that has ever been drummed up right. in the name of science. It's retarded. Right. You know, and, and you expect me to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ when you believe in something like evolution, that nothing became, you know, nothing came, you know, or everything came from nothing, right. and then slowly it just evolves and changes into just the multiplicity of everything we look around in this complex universe. That's stupid. Right. And that's something that you should be ashamed of. Right. I'm not going to be ashamed of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ, that's where the power lies. I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel. That's where the power lies. You're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna cause me to be ashamed of the gospel. That's where the power is. First uh, Peter chapter number four, verse number fourteen. I'm gonna read that to you. The Bible says, "If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye." You should be happy when you receive reproaches. When someone mocks you and scoffs you, you should train your mind to where I'm gonna be happy the next time someone mocks me and scoffs at me. You know, whether I'm at work, whether I'm out in the store and someone laughs at me for being a Christian, whatever it may be, someone looks at me and laughs at me for having a Bible, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to laugh back because of happiness. I'm going to be happy when he mocks me and scoffs at me. It says this, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Think about that. You should be happy because the spirit of glory, if you're being mocked, that means the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. It says this. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your, your part, he is glorified. We make sure that that's also said to be true, that we glorify him in the, the, the mockery. And then it says this, verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian. It's interesting because the word Christian is only used two times in your Bible, the book of Acts. They were first called Christians in Antioch, and then here, excuse me, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, listen to this, let him not be ashamed. If any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed if you suffer as a Christian. It says this, 
but let him glorify God on this behalf. If you're suffering as a Christian, that's a good thing. That's a good thing if you're suffering as a Christian. You shouldn't be ashamed of that. You should be counted uh, honored to be able to suffer for his name. I want you to turn uh, to, have you turned to um, Daniel? No, well, we actually read this earlier. Let me just review this. So another area where we shouldn't be ashamed, where people are commonly ashamed and commonly embarrassed, is to pray. Now let me preface this point with this. You know, we shouldn't be looking for opportunities to pray in front of people, to, be, to, to appear self-righteous like the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, that sort of, sort of attitude. We shouldn't be going out in public and making long prayers just you know, blowing trumpets so people listen to our prayers and things along those lines, right? We shouldn't be doing those things in public for people to see. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with praying in public when you're at, you know, at a table eating at a restaurant. There's nothing wrong with that, and you shouldn't be ashamed of that. There's nothing wrong, you know, uh, man, if you're working and then you go into the lunchroom or wherever you work at or you go anywhere, wherever it may be, and there's people sitting there and you open up your lunch. I'll tell you, every time I eat at lunch, there's people sitting around me most of the time and I pray. I don't care. You know what? And if you, you know, sometimes people are talking to me. I'll tell them, hold on a second. And I'll pray. I'll wait so that they, I even try sometimes so that they wouldn't see me do it. So I'll kind of wait and let them talk for a minute. I don't want it to be as obvious like, hey, watch me pray real quick. But if they continue to talk to me, and I'm, I'm hungry and I want to eat, I'll let them go for a minute. And then I'll tell them, hey, hold on a second. And then I'll pray real quick. And then I'll just say, what were you saying? Just try to not draw attention to me. What were you saying? Just so we don't talk about that. I don't want to draw this attention to my prayer like the Bible talks about. Right. But you know what? I'm not ashamed to pray. I have not, I'm not ashamed at all. You know what? That could be an opportunity where someone will ask you, hey, you're a Christian? Oh, really? You know, I don't know much about Christianity. Tell me about it. Okay. Well, Romans 3.10. Let's start there. How's that sound, right? It's a perfect opportunity to start giving someone the gospel, right? You shouldn't be ashamed to pray. You, know, you shouldn't be ashamed to pray in front of people. Not only Daniel was not afraid to pray at all. Daniel was not ashamed to pray. Daniel knew that I could have my head for this. Daniel knew that I could die. He didn't even close his windows. Right. He said he left his windows open and it says, as he did a four time. Right. In the exact same way. You know what that means? Nothing changed. Amen. He didn't go in a corner. He didn't go in a corner of the, you know, of the room where someone may not be able to see from the window. He prayed wherever he prayed before. There's a spot where he prayed three times a day. There's a time where he prayed and he did it the same time and in the same way. Nothing changed. You know why? Because he wasn't ashamed. Because we have nothing to be ashamed of. We should glorify God if we actually do end up suffering reproach or we're persecuted for the cause of Christ. We should be happy about that. There's nothing wrong with that. So you shouldn't be ashamed to pray. If we all go out to eat together, I have no problem, and I've done it numerous times. I'll even stand up sometimes. People have been with me when I've done that. We're at a table and nobody can hear, and I'll kind of scoot over and stand up. There's nothing wrong with praying in public. You know, if we're out eating at, you know, at a restaurant, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you can, you know, there's nothing wrong with, 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 with praying in public in the sense of a, a private prayer to your table. You know, you shouldn't stand up and ding, 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 ding. I have something to say. Lord, Jehovah Jesus. I mean, obviously there's something wrong there. But hey, if, if you want to say a prayer to the table that you're at real quick, you know, we need to pray before we eat. So let's sit down. Let's give thanks for the food real quick. Don't be ashamed of that. Don't be ashamed to pray in front of people. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it. We should glorify God. It's the exact opposite. Not only is there nothing wrong with it, we should glorify God if we are able to suffer reproach for his name. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter number 5, verse number 40. The Bible says this, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, think, listen to this and think about this in your mind. Make this realistic in your mind. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them. So they're commanding these men. I'm sure they're yelling at them. They commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then it says this. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. You know, all the apostles are walking away. Peter, James, John. You know, Peter might be smiling, missing a tooth. James has got like a big lash on the side of his face. You know what they're doing? They're happy. They're rejoicing. I want you to picture this in your mind. They're happy. They're like, that was great. I'm glad that I was able to suffer shame for his name. Amen. You know, that's why Peter says, you know, let none of you suffer as, you know, a, a, you know, a busybody in other men's matters, as a murderer, as a thief. But if you're able to suffer on behalf of Jesus, it's a good thing. 
It's a good thing. And we see the example of who? Of the apostles. Our greatest example of the New Testament. The apostles, the men that lived with Jesus, walked with Jesus, heard Jesus preaching, his teaching, learned under him. And then after he ascended to heaven, they were beaten for his name because they stood up for his name. You know what they said? This is great. This is great. You know what they did after that? It says they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. In every house, it says, and in the temple. That didn't stop them either. You know, just like Daniel didn't stop praying, they didn't stop preaching the gospel. The right. about the church will never stop preaching the gospel. Amen. As long as I'm the pastor here, we will never stop preaching Amen. the gospel. That's not, that's not happening. Doesn't matter if when, you know, there's a new ordinance that Florida, you know, that the, the, the Duval County passes or the, the city of Jacksonville. No soliciting of any form. It doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter. They can take, take us all to jail. I get back out and going knocking doors again. Amen. It's not going to stop us. We're going to keep doing this. You know what? That's an exact situation of Daniel. It is. A law was passed in his area. You know what? He did what he had to do anyways. We need to do that, which is right. We need to stand up for Jesus and for his name. Amen. You were there in 2 Timothy. Let, let me get there myself. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. <clears throat> So we saw we shouldn't be ashamed of the name of Jesus, right? The, the apostles, they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I'm not ashamed of Jesus, that there's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Number one, number two, we shouldn't be ashamed of being a Christian. The you know, Bible talks about not being ashamed of being a Christian there in 1 Peter chapter number four. Number, number three, we should not be ashamed of prayer. We should not be ashamed of prayer. I'll give you another thing here. And we're going to look in 2 Timothy Chapter number one. 2 Timothy chapter number one. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm in 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number one. Verse number eight. The Bible says this. <clears throat> Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to to the power of God. Notice that statement. He says two things not to be ashamed of. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Number one, of the testimony of our Lord. And then he says this, nor of me, his prisoner. So he tells him not to be ashamed of two things. Number one, we should not be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus. If you think of Jesus, you know, uh, dying in the way in which he died, it was not a pleasurable death. It was not a death of, you know, of, of, of the upper class. He died on a cross and he died as being condemned as, as an evil, wicked man, right? He died the death of someone who would have been a malefactor. That's the death that he died. That, you know, this man was commanded to be put to death in that sense, right? He didn't die a pleasurable death, is my point. You know what? We should be ashamed of that testimony. That should be, you know, the Bible says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved... It is the power of God. That's where Amen. the power lies. That's where the power of the gospel, that is the testimony of our Lord Jesus. And if you have the opportunity to share the testimony, whether out soul winning, whether at work, whether with a neighbor, you shouldn't be ashamed of that. Amen. You shouldn't be scared or afraid. You should take that opportunity and use it and give the gospel to that person. So we shouldn't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, it says there. But then also it says, be not there, thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me as prisoner. So we should not be ashamed when someone is being persecuted. We should not be ashamed when someone is, is going through afflictions. And I want you to notice what he says right after this as well. <clears throat> nor of me as prisoner, he says this, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Notice he says, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. He's speaking out of Timothy, and so basically he's giving him two options. You know, if you're not ashamed... He's saying you're going to be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. You know, so we can see that this is an outward expression where he's standing up for the testimony of the Lord. He's standing up for the testimony of Paul, Paul being a prisoner, right? He's not ashamed of these things. Therefore, he would be a partaker of the afflictions. So what would stop Timothy and what would cause him to be ashamed? Because he doesn't want to partake in the afflictions. What would, have, what would, what would you have said about Daniel if he chose not to pray? He would have been ashamed, wouldn't he? He would have been ashamed of the Lord, especially when you're put in a situation like that. He says right here again, I want you to notice what he's saying. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor be his prisoner, but be thou partaker. Notice how these things are contrasted. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. To the power of God. Look at verse number 
Let's skip down. Look at verse number 12. Verse number 11. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, speaking of the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause, for the gospel he's saying, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. So now you see the example that Paul sets for his protege, Timothy, saying, I'm not ashamed. Right after he told him, don't be ashamed. I'm not ashamed that I'm in bonds. I'm not ashamed that I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, and neither should you be. So he, and he's specifically speaking here, if you pay close attention, about the things that he is suffering. He's, he's speaking about being a prisoner. He says, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. Look at those words. Amen. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. Paul had a good understanding of who Jesus was. Paul had a good, you know, com a strong confidence in the Lord Jesus. And it didn't matter what trials, what afflictions that he would go through. Paul was not ashamed of the Lord Jesus. He was not ashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee. Notice here he's telling him to endure. He, all these things are talking about enduring. He's saying hold fast. Then he says here again in verse 14. That good thing which was committed unto thee by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Verse 15. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. What is he saying about that? What are they, why are they turned away about Paul or from Paul? Because they're ashamed of the testimony of Paul. They're ashamed because he was a prisoner, because he was being persecuted. Which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Verse 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and look at this, and was not ashamed of my chain. Notice the chain. What does the chain represent? It's kind of similar to the cross, isn't it? It's the persecution. It's him being a prisoner. He says he was not ashamed of my chain. That is his persecution. <clears throat> if someone in this church is persecuted, maybe me or anyone, you know, but any, it doesn't matter who it is, you shouldn't be ashamed of that. If I'm standing up for the Lord Jesus, you shouldn't be ashamed of that. Amen. You shouldn't be ashamed of anyone in this room, whoever it may be, that's willing to stand up for the Lord Jesus. It does. I'm not just saying this. You make as many videos as you want. They don't bother me. Jimenez made that video. I watched that video. I told people this, this is the truth. I rolled over and slept like a baby. He didn't bother me even a tiny bit. I, it, didn't, it didn't faze me at all. You know, it, not at all. You know, that's the way that we should be. If we have a clear conscience and someone persecutes us and they want to lie and twist things and do whatever, it's not going to bother me. You know why? Because I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against Amen. Him. It doesn't matter to me. You're not going to do anything to me. But you know what is good? It's to refresh those people. And I'm not just speaking to myself. You know, I don't need people to come up to me afterwards. I'm just, I'm preaching the Bible right now. If someone is persecuted, it's good to follow the Bible's example and refresh those people. What does it mean to be refreshed? You know, it's kind of like if you're thirsty, right? And you need to be refreshed by a drink. You know, you know it's kind of like if you're hungry. Right? Paul was obviously, he needed someone to, you know, to speak to him. He needed someone to tell him, hey, it's all right. Right? I'm not saying I need that. That's not what I'm talking about right now. But this is biblical. I'm preaching this because it's biblical. Right? It says he oft refreshed me. And it says it was not a shame in my chain. You know what would be refreshing? It's not that I need you to tell me, hey, you know, it's all right. Or, hey, this type of stuff. It, it would be refreshing if I saw somebody else stand up for the Lord Jesus. I'm not saying that you guys are. But I'm saying that's what would refresh me. You know what refreshed him? Because he wasn't ashamed either. That's what really refreshed Paul. What Amen. refreshed Paul was that somebody else was willing to stand up for the name, the name of the Lord Jesus as well. Somebody else was not ashamed of the reproaches of Christ and the suffering and the afflictions. He said, he oft refreshed me because he was not ashamed of my chain. He was not ashamed of the reproaches of Christ. And we have no reason to be. When the, when the apostles went away, they didn't have a, you know, people may have looked at them and they looked a mess and people are mocking and laughing at them. They have nothing to be ashamed of. They were beaten for an unrighteous reason. They were beaten without cause, right? They were beaten because they were standing up for the God of this universe, for the Lord Jesus. So we should, when someone's persecuted, you need to have a strong enough mind mentally to be able to see through the persecution. You know, when someone you know, is, is mocked and, and made fun of and ridiculed, 
You need to be strong enough mentally to see through those types of things. You need to not only be, you know, have a weak mind to where you take that perception of what's portrayed of the persecution and then view that person the same way that they were laid out in a video or whatever the persecution may be. Paul, everyone knows that Paul is in chains. Everyone knows that Paul is, you know, is a prisoner. Paul's, you know, he, he's, he's living and, and he's, he's looked down upon. He's living with all these other, you know, uh, in the slums with all these other, uh, you know, evil, wicked people, right? And you know, it, I'm sure a lot of people look down upon that man. They, you know, but you know what you need to do? You need to be strong enough to understand, I'm not going to be ashamed of Paul. Paul. Paul didn't do anything wrong. He's there because he's standing up for Jesus. And we should be the same way. We shouldn't cause someone being persecuted to, you know, in, in our mind, for, them, for us to look down upon that person. We should stand up for that person. We should stand up. You're standing up for Jesus. If they're standing up for Jesus, then you should stand beside that person and stand up for Jesus. Amen. That's what you should do. You shouldn't be ashamed of someone's chain. You shouldn't be ashamed of someone's reproach, especially, and of course in this sense, because it's for the Lord Jesus. Philippians chapter number 1, verse number 20 says this, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. And notice what it says, whether it be by life or by death. He's saying, I am going to magnify the Lord Jesus in my body no matter what situation I'm in, even if it comes to death, even if I have to magnify him and lift him up and, 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 and get the word out there that I was willing to die for him, that there was another martyr by the name of Paul for the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it be by life or death. You know what he says? I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm not going to be ashamed. He said, in nothing, in nothing I shall be ashamed, just like Daniel. Perfect example. Persecution came, and guess what? He still wasn't ashamed. In nothing, he's saying it doesn't matter the trials, the situations, you shouldn't be ashamed of the Lord Jesus. You should stand up for his name no matter what. You know, uh, one other thing is this. <clears throat> A quick point that I want to make is we should not be ashamed of God's law. We should not be ashamed of God's laws. Oftentimes, the atheists and these people, they, they want to mock God. They want to mock the Bible. And what do they do? They go to the, the laws of the Old Testament very often. You, yeah, that's not going to help you with me. You want to start mocking God's laws. The law of the Lord is perfect. Right, it's man. like, oh my gosh, you believe someone kills someone, they should be put to death? Without a doubt. Amen. A hundred million percent. You know, you shed man's blood, your blood should be shed, buddy. Right. That's just and that's righteous. The, the, the law of the Lord is righteous. Amen. You're not going to make me blush when you start talking about God's law at all, buddy. Amen. It doesn't matter. Bring up anything. You know, it doesn't matter. I believe all of it. Every last bit of it. Every jot and every tittle is perfect. I believe homosexuals should be put to death. Right. I believe people that kidnap, you know, right. children kidnap men, you should be executed. Amen. You Amen. should be put to death. Amen. I believe, you know, if you commit adultery in the United States, a perfect law would be if you commit adultery, you should be put to death. Right. I believe that. That's not going to make me blush. You're not going to make me ashamed. I don't care if somebody brings it up at work in front of every fellow worker and my boss. You want to ask me? I'm not going to go around just bringing things, these things up. Somebody asked me about it, I'm not ashamed. Yes. Amen. Definitely. Without a doubt. It would fix the problem of, of, of marriage and divorce and, and adultery going on in this country quick is what would happen. That's why. That's what people don't understand. You think that a, that a, that a child, it's not children as far as three, four, five, six. This person is a drunkard. There's a law in the Old Testament where if a child grows up in their, their father or their mother's house, they're stubborn, they're rebellious. Months and years have went on where they will not listen to their father. They are beaten by their parents and that's spanked, of course. They will not listen to their parents. They're a drunkard. This, 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 this teenager, if you will, an older teenager is drinking alcohol and he just thinks he's going to live in the house and they've been warned. They've been you know, pen, you know, punished by their parents. They are to be taken and executed. Right, right. I'm not ashamed of that. That's what the Bible teaches. You know what we have? A lot less punks in the United States of America walking around cursing their parents, right. walking around disrespecting their parents. Right. And they grow up to be a lot better person is what would happen. Our society wouldn't be in the shape that it's in if they were disciplined as a child and taught to keep the laws of God. Amen. Right. You know, there'd be a lot less STDs around the United States of America, too, if people that are committing adultery would be put to death. Right. You know, it's not. Here's, this is how it works. We wouldn't be putting 40 million, or even, there's not even 40 million people in our country. We wouldn't be putting hundreds of thousands of kids to death tomorrow. We'd be putting one. 
And then every child would have the fear in his heart where he'd obey his parents from that point forward. You're not going to make me blush. I'm actually going to expound unto you why this law is perfect. I'm not going to be ashamed of God's law. I'm going to explain it to you where you can understand it. Why I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to study God's law and I'm going to explain to you why the laws of the Bible are superior to the laws of the United States. Amen. We shouldn't be ashamed of God's law. We should bolster it. We should stand up for it. We should Amen. not be ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the judgments of God. I'm not ashamed of the judgment of hell. A lot of Christians today are ashamed that God created hell. I'm not ashamed of that at all. He's an eternal God. If you want to transgress against an eternal God and think he's going to be a pushover, you know, as long as he exists, you exist. You're going to be in hell for all eternity. But you know what? God loves you, and he doesn't want you to go there. That's right. what people always want to avoid. You're going there because you want to. They want to argue about, why would he create that? Why are you even worried about that? You're not God. Why would you even sit here and th think about that? Why not just get saved? Right. You know, why not just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, they want to focus on all, you know, the people that want to mock and scoff at God, they often just focus on the wrath of God. Why not focus on the love of God? He went there for you, sucker. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You want to sit here and talk about him, you know, everything that, that he's so mean, yeah, he took that same punishment that he was going to give you. Right. He right. went there and, and, and suffered in hell for you. Amen. That same punishment, he was willing to bite off a piece of that. Good. Think about that. Yep. You know, and the people want to mock God. Oh, he created hell. Yeah, you know what? He went there. Right. He went there and took that punishment. You know, oh, you think he's going to, yes, he will send people to hell because he's just, because he's righteous. That's what these, these atheists that live these sinful lives, they live these wicked, sinful lives, you know, the, the drunkenness and all this filth that they live in. And they think that they're going to sit in judgment in the creator, and you sit in judgment against the creator of the universe. You've got another thing coming to you, buddy. It doesn't work like that. You know, the, you, you would just ask them the question. I always just ask people the question all the time. So, you know, are, are you imperfect? You, you believe that your judgment's perfect? Then how are you qualified to even stand up and even attempt to say that there's anything wrong with that? Maybe because you're sinful and, and you, and, and humankind, you know, mankind, because we're sinners, we tend to sympathize with other people. Like, why would you do that? That's because you're not just. That's really where that comes from. Because you want to give people sympathy that don't deserve sympathy. That's why God tells people oftentimes when he implements the law of the Old Testament, thine eyes shall not pity. Because you know what he knows? That man, because I'm a sinner, I can, you know, I can maybe relate to this person that has sinned. It doesn't matter whether I can relate with you or not. We're both wrong. That's really what's going on. We're both wrong. And the reason why I can relate and the reason why I'm showing you sympathy is because I know that I've done the same thing. But that doesn't make it right. God is not a sinner. God is just and perfect, and that's why his laws are beyond. I would expect a perfect God to have a law that would be you know, far, you know, far beyond my understanding in that sense. I'm not ashamed of the judgments of God. I'm not ashamed of, of hell. I'm not ashamed of the judgments of God in the Old Testament. You know, these people like Bill Ma uh, Maher, Bill Maher, I almost call him Bill Maher. Bill Maher, right? I've heard him so many times just mock you know, that God God went into cities and just wiped people out. God committed genocide. Yeah, if you want to call it that. God went into cities and every person died. Man, right. woman, and child. You're right. not going to embarrass me about that. Amen. God's law is perfect. God's law is just. That's right. Everyone died. They were living, you know, just disgustingly wicked lives. The Bible explains that to you. And God even gave them time. You know, people want to ignore that. God said, I'm not taking you in there, Abraham, right now. You can look this. I don't know exactly where it's located afterwards. You want to ask me? I can look it up for you. God told Abraham that he was waiting for the times of, of their transgressions to come to the fullest. Because right. you know why? Because he's righteous. It wasn't time yet to punish every person there. So he waited because he was righteous, and he knows righteous judgment. And then once they had transgressed to the point that that is what as a nation they deserve. This was not just a personal punishment. This was the punishment as a nation. Where they just lived horribly wicked lives. God sent them in there to kill every man, woman, child. Everything that lives and breathes. Everything. I'm not ashamed of that. Amen. I'm not ashamed of that. If I can't understand it, that doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't make me, mean anything to me. You know, some atheist is not going to make me blush about that, buddy. I'll turn to you to the passages and read them to you. Amen. Yeah, you know, the, ones you, the cities you forgot that he destroyed, I'll tell you those other cities that he forgot. It's not just one. He did that a few times. He did that to seven cities. They took every last one of them out. I'm not ashamed of that. Because I believe when he did that, it was right. And it was just. I don't believe God was doing something wrong. You, you know, the atheist thinks he was doing something wrong. The atheist thinks he knows better. You know, but he seems to not be able to move out of his grandma's basement half the time. Right? 
you know, I don't believe God's doing anything wrong. God is perfect. And if there's something there I don't understand, then I'm wrong. I'm the one that's wrong. God is never wrong. God is never wrong. I want you to turn to the last passage here. Go to, uh, go to Ezra, Ezra not, uh, chapter 9, verse 6. Ezra chapter 9, verse 6. I'm going to read to you quickly from Luke chapter 6, verse 22. The Bible says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. It's for the name of Jesus, remember, if any man suffer as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed. That's what's going on here. It's just like the apostles. They went away rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. It says this in verse 23, Luke 6, 23. Rejoice ye in that day. Leap for joy. That's exactly what the apostles did. And leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. It's easy to read over these types of things and not to think about this. But the reason why the apostles went away rejoicing is because they were seated there when Jesus was teaching that. I'm sure it's because they had real joy, but I don't think it's a coincidence that they were all around him when he said, if you're ever able to suffer shame for my name, if you're ever able to be persecuted, to be afflicted for the Son of Man's sake, go away and leap for joy. And then what do we see them doing? Just four or five years later, the exact thing happens, however long that it was after the Sermon on the Mount. The exact same thing happens. What do they do? They went away rejoicing. The exact word. That they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So that's great that we have an example of the apostles, Daniel, so many people that, that, that were put into persecution where they were beaten, afflicted, some put to death. You know, and many others throughout history were burned at the stake, all different types of martyrs who, uh, that, that lived during the Roman Catholic Empire that was running, right? Over in Europe, in the Dark Ages. Many people died. You know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people have died for the name of Christ. And I guarantee that the apostles were just a few of those that were rejoicing while they were being persecuted. They were rejoicing while they were being beaten, while they were being afflicted. Uh, you're in Ezra chapter number 9, verse number 6. <clears throat> Ezra chapter number 9, verse number 6. I talked to you quickly about things that uh, we should be ashamed of. You know, we should be ashamed. We should not be ashamed of righteousness. You know, what we should be ashamed of is unrighteousness. That is what should make us blush. We should be ashamed of our sin, not Jesus. Look at Ezra chapter number nine, verse number six. The Bible says this. Look at verse five. I want you to see the humility here. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness. So his heaviness is his depression, his oppression. You know, he's feeling bad. Obviously, he's sorrowful. And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Notice Ezra was ashamed. Ezra himself may not have even been living a sinful life. Ezra himself may not have had a multitude of iniquities, but you know what his nation did? And he was ashamed of the sins of his nation. I'm ashamed of my nation. Right. Very often, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm happy that I live in the United States of America in the sense that I have many more freedoms than, than most of the nations in this world, but there are many things that I am ashamed of. Right. There are many things that I am ashamed of. You know, the president that we have the lifestyle that he lives, I'm ashamed of that. I'm Amen. ashamed of the dirty, filthy things that have come out of that guy's mouth. Right. I'm ashamed of the lifestyle that he lives. I'm ashamed of every stinking president we've had for many decades. Right. For many terms, I'm ashamed of him. I'm, you know, we need to be ashamed of the nation. You know what? Ezra had the same attitude. And if Ezra lived in the United States of America, he would be ashamed of this nation in many ways. Right. There, are, there are good things about our nation still. But there are a lot of bad things. People need to face that. Just because you live in this country doesn't make it the greatest, buddy. You'd be right. saying the same thing if you lived in Iraq and you were a Muslim. Right. It's just because you were born here. And that doesn't make it a great country. You know, as far as morally, I'm speaking. We, need to, we should be ashamed of, our, of the sins of our nation. You right. think it's a coincidence that people persecute and mock Christianity even more today than they did in the past? And they're that much more filthy and sinful than they were in the past? When there was a bunch of you know, uh, Christians in, in the sense of Christianity following and practicing an attempt to be a Christian, even though a lot of them weren't saved, but they were attempting to live the life of a Christian, there was a lot less to be ashamed of. You know what? They start forsaking Christianity and they start getting into 
you know, uh, you know, debauchery, all sorts of debauchery and sin and, and evil. You know, and you know what? There's a lot more. And then they become they become ashamed of Christianity. They mock Christianity. Notice there's two sides to be on. So you need to pick one. Remember, he told them, you're either, you know, don't be ashamed of my afflictions, but suffer. It's one or the other. If you know, if you're if you're gonna if you're going to be ashamed, you're not gonna suffer. Right? If you're going to suffer, you're not going to be ashamed. Let it, if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. We should be ashamed. We should be, if we stand in our personal lives as well, we should be ashamed. We should be ashamed of that. We shouldn't justify it because it's us. It's the same attitude with our country. Oh, because it's my country, it's great. No, it doesn't work that way. If you sin in your personal lives, you should be ashamed of it. Right. We shouldn't have a proud attitude. We should be ashamed of the sin in our life. We should get it out. Amen. We should be ashamed if we're living a sinful life. and We should forsake that and feel bad about it. And we should have the humility that Ezra has here. We should be ashamed of our sin. Jeremiah chapter number 6 is another place that, that makes me think of as well. It talks about, and we read here just the other day, uh, when I preached the sermon on uh, um, you know, why I'm a fundamentalist. It talks about the old paths, right? And in Jeremiah chapter number 6 it says, were they, were, they, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. And it says this, neither could they blush. You know what they did? They forsook the old paths and they weren't ashamed of their sin. We know what they were ashamed of, I'm sure, is the old paths. They were ashamed of fundamental Christianity, just like our nation is today. They forsook the old paths. They're, if you say you're a fundamentalist, you're insane. You're a crazy weirdo, radical, right? Fundamentalists, what are you, Muslim? They're fundamentalists, right? You know, our nation forsakes biblical Christianity. They get into sin and they become ashamed of Christianity. That's what happens. You know what they're not ashamed of? Nor do they blush about their sin. Right, right. You know? You know, you're on one side or the other. You need to be ashamed of your sin and not ashamed of Christ. Amen. The last passage I want to read to you is Mark chapter 8, verse number 38, because this applies to Christians as well. <clears throat> in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14 that I read earlier, it said, If any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. So you know what? You could even suffer as a Christian. You could even be beat. You could even be persecuted. You know, you could be suffering as a Christian. And you know what? You could be ashamed. Just to try to get your, yourself out of that situation. Just to try to stop, you know, the beating. You know, it's a perfect example. The man who wrote that. Peter. What? He got put into a situation. What happened? I, not, I don't know the man. I don't know who he is. It's like, you're a Galilean. Your speech, uh, you know, betray a few. It's like, I don't know who he is. He starts cursing. What did he do? He was afraid of, his, of, of standing up for his name. He's afraid to suffer persecution for Christ. He saw what was happening to him and he didn't want that to happen to himself. He saw what was happening to Jesus and he didn't want it to happen to himself. He was afraid to suffer shame for his name. But it's great that we can see the example where later he goes away rejoicing. How Amen. worthy to suffer shame for his name. He got it right. Amen. He grew as a Christian. Mark chapter number 8, verse number 38, speaking to Christians. Keep that in mind. It says this, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words... And this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So notice those two elements that I've been bringing up all throughout this sermon are both here in this verse. It says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Who should really be ashamed? This adulterous and sinful generation. We, we should not be ashamed. They should be ashamed. We shouldn't side with the adulterous and sinful generation. You know, while in our hearts we believe in the Lord Jesus, while in our hearts, you know, we, we're, we're standing up in our hearts, right? And that, you know, people will say that. The story of the child in the classroom. You know, we're taking a stand in our hearts, but then we're quiet. You know, Daniel prays quietly. No, we should stand up. And we should be ashamed of the adulterous and sinful generation and stand against them and stand up as a Christian and not be ashamed. You can suffer as a Christian. You can be saved. And, be, and still be ashamed. Right. That's why Jesus says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words. Notice me and my words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. They're one. If you're ashamed of Jesus, you're ashamed of his words. You're ashamed of his words, you're ashamed of him. Ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. It says this. What a sad statement. Of him. So the man that was ashamed of Jesus. Of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. So I don't want to be, you know, ashamed of the Lord Jesus when he comes back. Think about this. There will, there will be people that will make it through 
the tribulation. The Bible is very clear about that. There will be people that, you know, that, that are able to make it through the tribulation. He tells them, look up, you know, uh, for your redemption draweth nigh. Right? So Jesus is about to come back. And Peter said, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. You can go through the suffering. You can endure the pain. You can endure the hardness. You can endure the persecution. But you can still be ashamed. There will be Christians when Jesus comes back that even made it through the tribulation. But they were ashamed. Think about that. He said, whosoever is ashamed of me you know, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father. Think about that. And with his holy angels. You can make it, but you know what? I don't want to just make it through the tribulation. I want to make it through the tribulation rejoicing that I was counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. All the persecution that I stand up for, I want to be happy, like it says in 1 Peter 4 there. Happy are ye if you're, if you're able to suffer for his name. You know, you know, why shouldn't we be ashamed? Let me end with this last note. Because the power lies in the gospel. The power lies in the name of Jesus. Amen. That name, the name that will literally cause every human being that has ever lived to bow, I have no problem suffering shame for that name. Amen. Nothing wrong with that at all. I have no problem suffering shame for the man. The name of the man and the person that every person will bow and say, you are Lord. You are God. Right. Why would you be ashamed to suffer? Why would you be ashamed to suffer for that name? There's no reason to be ashamed. That's what I want you to take away from this. There's no reason to be ashamed Amen. for the name of the Lord Jesus and of Christianity. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, you know, uh, for being the great God that you are, for standing up for us, dear Lord, and all the great things that you've done for us, dear God. I ask you that you would help us and give us the, the courage and give us the, you know, the valiant heart that we would stand up for you and that we would be happy while we go through the persecution, that we would... We would uh, go away rejoicing if we ever are, uh, you know, beaten and uh, counted worthy to suffer shame for you. For your name. Help us in the small persecutions that we go for, through. Your Lord in our life, help us to stand up for your name and not to be ashamed of it. Help us not to be ashamed of, of the judgments that you saw fit and to understand that they're righteous, dear Lord. And help us to study and to be able to give an answer to every man that asks a, hope of, of, uh, a reason of the hope that is in us. Dear God, just be with us and, and help us not to be ashamed of you and of your words. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.